before we start. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to PMP Live. We're here tonight with two incredible authors, Jay Courtney Sullivan and Connie Schultz. Uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, bring up two quick uh, housekeeping notes. The first is, is that at the bottom of your screen, you can see a little Q&A feature. And if you click on that, you can ask a question. We're going to devote um, a couple minutes at the end for your audience questions. So please uh, type your questions in there and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, the second is that in just a moment, I am gonna put a link to each of tonight's books in the chat, and those will link you to Politics and Prose's website where you can purchase the books, and we recommend that you guys purchase um, as many copies of those as you like. Uh, it's a great <laughs> way to support our authors and support politics and prose. And with that out of the way, it is my honor to introduce J. Courtney Sullivan and Connie Schultz. J. Courtney Sullivan is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Commencement, Maine, The Engagements, and Saints for All Occasions. Tonight she'll be discussing her new novel, Friends and Strangers. We're also honored to be joined by Connie Schultz, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and professor in residence at the Journalism School of Kent State University, which is her alma mater. She is the author of two memoirs, Life Happens and, and His Lovely Wife. And tonight she'll be discussing The Daughters of Erie Town. So without any further ado, here are Jay Courtney Sullivan and Connie Schultz. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I so love politics and prose. I wish we were there in person, but I'm delighted to see Connie. Um, I, uh, many, many years ago when I was writing my first novel um, and my second novel. My day job was at the New York Times. I worked in the editorial department as a researcher for two of the columnists there, uh, Bob Herbert and Gail Collins. And in that job, I met the wonderful opinion writer, Maura Casey, who is a friend of Connie's. And One of my best friends. Me I love her so much. And she introduced yeah. me to your work. I know she is your friend and also your fan as a writer. And, um, and I've loved your work ever since. So I was so delighted when they sent me an early copy of your book, The Daughters of Erie Town. And I, I just gobbled it up. I loved it so much. And so I'm really excited you, to talk to you about how it is that you came to fiction um, this time around. and. I guess like to start with, I would just ask kind of what was the, the sort of starting point for this novel? Where did it begin? Well, I want to hold, since you held up mine, I'm going to hold up yours. Oh, okay. Just came out, just came out. And um, I've been a long, as you know, from our correspondence, I told you I was a long time fan of your work and was delighted for the chance to get to know you a little bit better. Um, I'm very excited for you for this book. And I wanna talk at length about this book at some point here because there's some, there's some intersections we have on issues in our books, but they're also very different. Yes. Um, our beginnings have similarities, but they're different in terms of timing. Obviously it took me a lot longer to go from journalism to novel writing. I do wanna also, again, encourage everyone, if you're going to buy um, either book, please consider doing it tonight with Politics and Prose. We are. I am so grateful to the, and Courtney, I know you've been doing the same thing. We've been doing these events with bookstores around the country, independent booksellers. They are keeping us afloat as authors with new books who are doing all of these from home. And I want us to show our support for them in any way we possibly can because they need us right now. They need our dollars. So please, if you haven't bought our books yet and you want to, and I hope you do, uh, please buy them tonight from Politics and Prose. So, Courtney, the way this book came about, I wish I could say it was something that I've been burning in me for decades, but it, it really wasn't. I was a journalist for almost 30 years before I even started thinking about it. And my editor at Random House is Kate Medina, and she had been my editor on the first two nonfiction books. And she took me to lunch uh, well, right before my second book was coming out in 07, to give you an idea how long this took, um, and said to me that the working class is really underrepresented in modern literature. Mm -hmm. And she thought I could do something about it. Um, I agreed with her that that was true about the working class. I mean, I come from the working class. I was the first in my family to go to college. 
I've been reading fiction since almost the time I could read. And seldom did I see the people I come from in books in any meaningful way. Um, there were often props, often problems, right? Um, but it took me a lot longer to, to really comprehend, no, that's a right word, to, to believe that I could do it, that I could, I, I had such reverence for fiction and for novelists, and I still do. And it took me a long time to decide that I could possibly do this. And I think I really got there after I, I could answer this question, which would you most regret? And the answer was not having tried, not having written it. So yeah. you, came up, you came about this so much sooner. And I'm curious, when did you first know that you wanted to write fiction? Well, I first knew I wanted this to be a career um, in fourth grade because wow. I was a lover of books, you know, as a kid, I think that's how we all begin um, as writers. We start as readers first, right? And that's what kind of leads us to think we might want to try it ourselves. So I loved reading. Um, I was always writing short stories and poems and plays. And when I was in the fourth grade, um, a real writer came and spoke to my class. And I regret to say that I do not remember what her name is <laughs> um, because she really kind of changed the path of my life. You know, I did wow. not grow up in a sort of, I didn't grow up with writers or, you know, knowing people in the arts. So um, it kind of astonished me that, oh, you know, these books that I read, uh, creating them is someone's job, you know, and, and here she is. And she was telling us about her work and she said, um, my mom and I still laugh about this because she said, you know, I always thought that being a writer was just sitting at your kitchen table with your dogs at your feet, drinking tea and coming up with stories and children. That is exactly what it is. And so I thought, OK, sign me up for that. <laughs> um, it's not totally what it is, but sometimes I guess in its best moments, that is what it is. Um, yeah. So I always kind of had my eye on that from a young age. but. You know, again, I didn't really know, well, how do you do that job? You know, it didn't seem as clear cut as say, I want to become a dentist or something, you know, like there's a path. Right. Um, right. So what I did, you know, I really asked as many writers as I could find, especially when I got to college, any writer who came to campus, I would ask them sort of what they did, how they got there. And almost all of them um, said that they had worked in magazines for a period of time. I think by the time I graduated in 2003, so I think by then the magazine business had changed quite a lot from uh, what it had been when these people were in it and when they were getting to write, you know, long form fabulous pieces 20 years earlier. But I followed their advice because I'm a very obedient uh, student and I, I went to New York, I worked at Condé Nast um, as, what it was called a rover, a very, uh, very prestigious position of being kind of like an in-house temp where they kind of send you from one magazine to another. And uh, a lot of people would not even bother to learn your name because you were there for such a short time. So they would just call you rover. It was really a real self-esteem builder. And then I worked <laughs> at um, a lore magazine, a women's magazine for two years before I got this really fabulous job at the Times that was it was just the perfect job it was a dream you know it, it was really interesting work and yet it was also a job which me, oh i like your so ring that allowed me to um to do my own work too you know to to work on my novel um at night and on the weekends and so uh yeah i just kind of you know, I did that. I was in that job for four years, um, during which commencement my first novel was published. And then I uh, wrote about half of my second novel, Maine, before I sold it to my publisher. I'm, I'm curious what your work habits were for writing your novel when you had a full-time job like that. How, how did you carve out that time? Um, and, and I don't presume anything about your life at that point. I don't know when you married and when you started having kids, which to me, it's such an annoying question because I notice that male authors seldom get asked about family life. But I am curious with a full-time job, how you manage the discipline, because it is a discipline, is it not, to get a novel done? Totally. totally. And, you know, a lot of people will say that to me, like, well, I have a full-time job or I have kids or I have both. And how do I, I really want to write a novel, but how do I do it? 
And my feeling is that we all have, have something that kind of burns Ooh. in us and we are going to do it. So, you know, I always think about the marathon. I've lived in New York for 20 years, every year, once a year, you know, the marathon comes around and I think, wow, that's so amazing. I want to do that. I want to be one of those people. But I know I will never be one of those people because those people, <laughs> you know, they get up really early and they run and they run and they run and they, they you know, whatever they do to become those marathoners. Um, it's super inspiring. And the finished product when you see them running by is so amazing, but, but not all of us can be that person, right? So it's like, for me, the thing that burned in me was to write a novel. And um, so all through my 20s, uh, I that's what I did on the weekends. You know, I always like, I had a, a thing, I didn't want to become too much of a weird shut in. So I remember I would always have a plan that I would at least see one person a day. I would like meet a friend for breakfast and write for the rest of the day, or I would go out at night and write all day. So um, that was just what I did. I lived in, uh, in an apartment with my best friend from high school and she had always, she's a lawyer, but she had always read my short stories, even in high school, she was like my reader. And so, you know, she just, yeah, that was just what I did. She'd be going out for the day, going to live her life. And there I'd be sitting at our kitchen table writing my novel. Um, I used to also throughout, and I kind of do a version of this now, um, through the course of a week, like I wouldn't have time to write, but I would be constantly keeping notes on yeah. whatever piece of paper I could find. It would be a dry cleaning receipt or whatever. And um, my ritual on Saturday morning was to go through my purse and pull out all the little pieces of paper that where I'd made the notes throughout the week and like put them on the table and try to make sense of what I had been thinking three days earlier or whatever it was. And so this issue that you raised of, of writing while you have children, and I think you're right. You know, I was talking to another writer last week who said to me after the fact, like, I can't believe you wrote your most recent novel with two little kids, but I didn't want to ask about it because I don't think it's really a feminist thing to ask women about that. But personally, I actually disagree. I think the more we talk about how you have a life and a career, the better. And I think you're right that men don't get asked this as much. And actually, maybe it's not that women shouldn't be asked it. It's just that men should be asked it more often. Um, I think that's a great point. I really do. I mean, there's not a woman I know, no matter what she does with her life, who isn't um, handling multiple things at once. It's, you know, writers are just one example of oh, us yeah. having other lives as well. This is so, and you know, it, it reminds me a little bit about one of the themes of your book. Women's ambition mm -hmm. is definitely a central theme to your latest book. And I, I, I'd love you to, to talk about that a little bit, Warren, um, because it's, it does seem to be something you've had to think about in your own life as well. And women, um, still too many women, I think, um, are reluctant to talk about their ambition that we, certainly my generation was raised yeah. to think that, you know, that that wasn't something we were supposed to talk about very much. And yet it's at the core of so many of us. Certainly I've been an ambitious person mm -hmm. um, always as a writer and as a journalist. And, and it really, more than any of your other books, it, it, at least that I can, I've read them all, but it, with, if memory serves, this one touched upon that it dealt, did a deep dive in it in a way that the others had not. Am I yeah. correct about yeah. that? Yes, thank you. I love that. That's such a smart observation. I hadn't thought of it in that way, but absolutely. And I think it's, a, it's actually a theme in your book too. So I would love to hear you talk about that as well, because you're right. I think that um, my books, and I, I thought this a lot reading your novel, um, I think as writers, we tend to kind of return to certain obsessions in our work again and again and again, even if the books are very different from one to the next. So for me, I always come back to this idea of, you know, the moment a woman is born will determine a lot about who she's allowed to become. And certainly there's our inner lives, our inner selves, and sort of what we personally, each individual brings to the table, but there's also just the constraints of our, of our time, right? And when we happen to be born and what women are allowed to do at that moment and whether uh, an individual woman, you know, complies with that or rebels against it or what she does. And certainly I, I thought that all through reading your book too. Um, so in this book, uh, I, so I started writing, I think this is probably my most autobiographical novel and 
Uh, the reason is, you know, my other books, like, as I said, I was a researcher at the Times for four years. I, I dreamed of one day not having to do research anymore and just getting to write fiction. And truly, I think it was like the second day that I was writing fiction full time. I was sitting at my desk and I was like, I just miss doing research so much. I love doing research, you know, like I, it was crazy to think I didn't want to do research all day. So for most of my novels, I've done quite a lot of research. I've traveled a lot. Um, my last novel, I've lived with cloistered nuns for a while and that was really wow. fascinating. And um, so, you know, I love doing that, but with this book, I was pregnant with my first child when I started it. Um, I was nine months pregnant with him when I went on book tour for my last book, Saints for All Occasions. So I did my last book tour event two days before he was born. Wow. I was so pregnant. I mean, it was like, the, the, <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was like the beginning of the tour. I was like a month away from giving birth and, and it was sort of like, this is so, you know, sort of adorable and novel and, and funny, you know, how very pregnant I am. And by the end, when you're like two days from giving birth, it's just no longer funny. You know, I just remember pulling into a library parking lot and thinking, I, I pray that no one comes to this event so I can just go home. Um, but then uh, when my son was seven months old, I was pregnant again with my daughter. My kids are 16 months apart. So while I was writing this book, I was also having the experience of becoming a mother for the first time and the second time, but they're so close together that it almost just feels like one big, you know, blur. And um, I just didn't, I didn't have like the chance in life to be going and living with nuns or whatever, but also I think there are these moments of transition in your life when you go through a much bigger change than you do, you know, some years than others. And certainly this moment for me, the research I was doing was just in my own home and in my own body, you know, it was just these huge changes happening. Um, and for the first time in maybe 20 years, I was finding myself doing a lot of, I wouldn't say journaling, but I was writing down what was happening to me and what was happening in my life. And also the lives of all of my friends, which were sort of on a parallel plane. And going back to your original question, this issue of ambition, you know, um, Elizabeth, the mother in the book, and I maybe should say that for those who haven't read the book, the book is about a college age babysitter, college senior named Sam, and um, she babysits for a woman named Elizabeth for her new baby. So the, the relationship was really based on a relationship I had as a babysitter um, my senior year at Smith uh, with a woman who had just moved from New York to Northampton, Massachusetts, had just had her first baby. And we were very close. It was nowhere near as dramatic as what happens in the novel, because that's what you can do with a novel, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, But we were very close. And I think she very much kind of put me on the path to everything that came after to going to New York and being a writer as I wanted to be. And, um, and 10 years later, I was back at Smith to give a reading from one of my books. And I saw her, I ran into her and she had no idea who I was because it had been 10 years, you know, and um, she'd had two more kids and many more babysitters by then, I'm sure. But she had made such an impact in my life. And when I was pregnant with my son, um, I felt like, oh, this is a story I could tell now from both sides or not now, but soon, you know, having been the new mother and having been the babysitter. Well, it's um, so interesting to hear you talk about being pregnant as you're writing because you have moments in there. I, I was reading it remembering pregnancy because like when she <laughs> goes to her new office that she has and sometimes she starts writing notes and sometimes she just ends up lying on the floor and falling asleep. and. Oh. I, boy, is that a part of pregnancy, right? <laughs> Moments. And she's grappling with um, wanting this career to continue, but having all this other stuff and loving her child yeah. very much and oh, feeling yeah. guilt. To, I mean, th but this is also a novel about secrets and we both deal with secrets a lot, family secrets yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the book. And I've been asked a lot, I don't know if you're getting these questions about 
Um, why do you emphasize so much? Why is it important to deny that? Well, because everyone has secrets. Oh, yeah. We all have secrets, oh, right? Yeah. And the keeping of the secret, of course, is always sort of more more complicated and more interesting than the secret itself, or at least, you know, much of the time. Um, and I'm always fascinated, and you do this so beautifully in your book, and I would love to hear you talk about it more, that sort of intergenerational um, reverberations of a secret, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, sure. It, it, certainly, I know what you're talking about. It, it, you know, it's always a delicate dance to talk about novels because we don't want to give the stories away. Exactly. I haven't read them yet. Um, but certainly, secrets play a big part so many times, but there's one major secret that really alters the family in significant ways. And um, both of our Sams, by the way, we both have young women named Sam, yes. have brothers who treated them too much as confidants at times. Mm -hmm. So that's a central theme of mine where you just touch upon it a bit, but it yeah. becomes real, it really molds who Samantha is in my book. And, um, and our, we're talking about different classes, but not entirely. One of the things I most love about your book, I, I absolutely agree with Ron Charles. This is not, it, it would be a mistake to, to categorize this as domestic fiction because you really get into class yeah. and the differences of class. And if you don't mind, I would like to be one paragraph in your epilogue. Oh, that's so kind. So much. Would that be okay? Because okay. I loved it so much. Oh my gosh, Connie Schultz is reading my book out loud. I can't, I'm- I am going to. Wow. Um, for your patience, but I think the readers will like it. She supposed it was childish, simplistic, but Sam still could not square the discrepancies of lives that overlapped with one another every day. She looked at the people digging up roads and bussing dishes and caring for other people's children, holding up the world, and wondered what they'd rather be doing. She was 31 years old, and she couldn't quite accept that some people would be allowed and encouraged to pursue their passions, while others never would. But she knew that whether she accepted it or not, nothing to erase the fact, well, excuse me, did not erase, did nothing to erase the fact of it. Every year, it seemed, the country moved closer and closer to a place where there would soon be very rich people and very poor people and very few in between. Mm. I, I'm sure won't surprise you know I love that so much. It is so central to the theme of my book because in part, my book is a story of what they'd rather be doing. Right. The hopes and dreams they have. Right. That, and as I've said countless times now about this story because it's so true about working class people and not just white working class people, which mm -hmm. are, and in fact are not in your book are not just white working class people that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we have all our hopes and dreams as well. It, the problem is when the big, big stuff comes, the big problems, and there's no money to fix them. That's right. what not, not only derail dreams, but derail lives. Right. And then they turn to their children and try to invest all their hopes and dreams in their children, even if their children have different ideas of what those hopes and dreams could be. Exactly. And that I see play out over and over again. I saw it growing up and I see it in this beloved community that raised me, Ashtabula, Ohio. Um, and I tried to show some of that in the Daughters of Erie Town, because to me, that's one of the primary struggles with, with my books. One of the ways I've tried to describe it is it's the feminist movement you didn't hear about because right. it was the feminist movement, but it was women trying to make sense of it in their own lives through the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s, and then bringing daughters into the world who were going to tell their mothers what it meant to be feminist and the tension yeah. that it sometimes create, even as it made the mothers hopeful for their lives. So that yes. when I read that in your epilogue, which is set in, is it 2025? Am I correct about that? Yes. Uh, after I'd read the whole book and loved it, I thought, oh my God, that is just so perfect. That is exactly right. So thank, thank you, you for reading this book. That is so kind. Thank you. That means the world to me. I, I love what you said about how your editor um, came to you talking about the working class and, and how you might sort of write about this group of people in fiction, because I absolutely agree with her that it isn't really um, a population that we read about enough in fiction. And I think, you know, in most of my books, it's something I've tried to get at um, because that's, you know, fiction is a reflection of the world or it should be, and that is the world we live in. Um, and, you know, the sense that actually, although we have uh, very different socioeconomic classes in this country, it's 
it's not true that they all exist in their own separate bubbles that, and don't touch one another. In fact, we interact all day, every day with these, uh, you know, other people of other uh, socioeconomic brackets, especially through our work. And that's something that in this book I was thinking about quite a bit. Um, it's not just the difference between Elizabeth, who's very wealthy, and Sam, who's coming from just kind of a middle class American family. Um, but also the women Sam works with in the kitchen and, and the sense of, you know, who has a safety net and what is a safety net. Um, part of my own sort of thinking about it, writing while I was writing the book, while I, you know, in my children's earliest years is that I've been involved with this volunteer organization called Immigrant Families Together. And we're all women, we're all mothers, except for one. And um, we have just kind of a grassroots group that came together when Trump started separating families at the border. And our mission has just been one by one by one to reunite mothers and children and then support them um, on an ongoing basis with their legal fees and their medical and school and everything. And in dealing with getting to know these women, it really hit home for me the idea that, you know, there's not just like having a safety net, there's also being a safety net. These women are coming to this country with what we would consider nothing. They have nothing. They owe money to coyotes, they, you know, whatever it is. But actually they, because just by virtue of being on American soil are considered by their own families to be the safety net. They're supposed to be sending money home right away. And so that notion, you know, of this sort of unbelievable spectrum of it all is something I really wanted to think about, talk about in fiction. Well, you had El Salvadorians in your book and part of our family has El Salvadorians, ah. members of our family. So that really touched me. I, what I, I feel so strongly about this that I love when you said we intersect all the time, but unfortunately only one group sees the other too often. The people who wait on us see us, right? The people who serve us, the people, um, but we often don't, I always think of my mom's advice to us girls, don't marry him till you see how he treats the waitress. Totally, totally. What that was how we treat the people we're allowed to mistreat is the measure of who we are. And both of my parents were people who could be mistreated. My dad was a utility worker, like yeah. Rick McGinty in my book. And my mom was a nurse's aide, like Ellie McGinty. And, and in fact, after my mom died at 62, I'm going to be 63 in a couple of weeks, which means I will have outlived my mother. Yeah. And my father died in his 60s as well. And after my, my father died, um, my sisters discovered this list of nurses' aid duties that my mom made that was pages and pages long, all handwritten. And she had enough copies for all of us. And we have no idea, it, it haunts me. Why did she make this list? Hmm. Was she thinking none of us understood how much she loved her job and why she thought it was important? Wow. But I realized in the writing of the novel, you know, we do research. I did so much research for this because I have so many decades to represent here. Uh, when it came time for Ellie to try to get Brick to understand why she did not want to leave her job, because he felt jealous of it. She's found meaning in her work that she wasn't finding with her family who was scattered to the winds. Yeah. She sat, sits down and writes that list. And that list is a partial list of my mother's real list. Wow. I oh, I love that. I love that. So I don't know why you did it, mom, but at least a lot more people know a little bit more about what you did. I love that. Your novel is my favorite kind of novel where you are showing us American history, American culture unfolding through these very human, regular people. Thank you. So how did you do that? How did you achieve that? And how did you take the research that you did and sort of weave it in so effortlessly so that it doesn't feel like the author's research. It just feels like what's happening in the lives of these characters. Well, a lot of that guidance came from my editor, Kate Medina, because my initial draft did not have as many historical references in it. Mm -hmm. And she suggested, just to give readers a better sense of time and place, that I, and, and she said exactly what you were saying I needed to avoid, right? Don't, don't make it feel like the writer just plucked down and now you are here in 1964. And, 
And so, in fact, if you look at the corner there, there's a, the, the blue train case from my novel is actually there. Oh my goodness. I found it on um, Etsy, I think. It's from the 1950s. I wanted one from that time period. And because I needed to feel it, I needed to feel how heavy it was. I needed to smell it. I needed to see what it looked like inside. It's in wonderful condition. Um, the, if you, when you go get birthday cards, I don't know if they even still have them anymore. Um, they used to have these pamphlets in the year that you were born and they would tell oh, you all yeah. these things. So I found them from 1947 through 1996 on eBay, on Etsy, on random book sites. I find some on Amazon because I wanted, it, it was a good trigger for me. It, it would prompt me to remember certain things. Certainly you think you would remember so much about your youth. I'm here to tell you, you don't. You remember big <laughs> moments of your own. But you really don't know what month and what year a song came out often. And right. I need to know because I really wanted music to play a part of the a role in this. Yeah. I wanted literature to be a part of it because working class people read also. And um, so just remembering what, you know, knowing for sure when books came out. Most of it came pretty naturally once I started using it. When I, when I started thinking about the themes I wanted to present, um, it's been so interesting to have people respond to both the food of the times. They remember mm -hmm. some spam. All you have to just say spam. And so right. they remember eating that if they're working class, in fact, particularly growing up in the 50s and 60s. But sometimes it was serendipity. Um, I was in 1963, 62, 63, and I'm trying to figure out how to add to this. And a friend, my friend Ann Hansen in Montana, sends me two Life magazine issues from that year. And one of them has, is a multiple page story about my dear friend Annie Glenn. Hmm. John Glenn's wife and I thought you know Annie John had already died the former astronaut the senator and he was very ill at that point and I'm, I'm not even sure she when I wrote the letter to tell her what I had done I'm not sure she knew but I decided to have Ellie McGinty sitting there talking about looking at the magazine with her sister this is on the day that JFK is killed mm -hmm. and they're just they're just bleeding right they're talking so much is going on and Ellie's got all this stuff going on with Brick and it dawns on her that nobody ever talks about what a hero Annie Glenn was because she had to wait on earth and nobody knew if her husband was going to return because he was the first American to circle the earth. Right. And it was such a wonderful moment to have the magazine and know that that's the exact magazine that could be in this. And it was, as I said, serendipitous. A, a friend sent it to me and it was just perfect timing. These things are so organic in some ways, aren't they? I mean, there's no substitute for the discipline of writing. But so much of it is once the characters are rattling that cage in your head, you do mm -hmm. find ways to bring them to life. And Sherrod would laugh because sometimes I would be watering plants out in the garden or something. I'd say, oh my gosh, you're right, you're right, you're right. And, and he says, who are we talking to? <laughs> I, said, I just realized Ellie would never say that. Ellie would have done this instead. You know, and, you, and it's that sheet of paper. You go run it. Sherrod has a rule in our house. Anything with grandma's handwriting on it, don't touch it. Oh, I love that. Oh, it's got to be it. When you said that about the notes in your purse, I thought, oh my God, it's a place. <laughs> don't do this. It is. It's amazing because the characters, your characters, once you get going, they live in your head just like any other person in your life, you know, and, and you think about them like you do the other people in your life. And and as you said, that one of my favorite things is that is what you just described, that things that come to you in the course of a day or a week, you know there's sort of this magic, this sort of energy around them where you just know oh, that belongs in the book. And it, it right. sort of has come to me for that reason. It's really a remarkable thing. And it, you have to give it time for it to happen. You can't rush these things. But once you, but, but I do think the regular dedication to the work on it, let your mind work for you when you're not thinking about it. And that's how all of a sudden these things will pop up. Sherrod tells this story over about, when you talk about how the characters become real to you, let's call him George, because I don't want to give anything away, but Sherrod walks through the door and I'm almost done with my first draft. And, he, and I, I am habitually cheerful, much to the annoyance of some who love me. And <laughs> but I wasn't that day when he walked in and he said, what's the matter? And I said, oh, George died today. And he said, well, honey, you've been writing this book and you created George and you either, you're the one who's killed him off. You knew he's going to die. And I said, I know, but I've, I've known George for seven years now and I'm really going to miss him. Yeah. And the first time I realized, even in my own little head here, that they've become something more than just these characters I was typing out on a page. Oh, yeah. So you were writing this book for a number of years and yeah. was it 
what was your fiction writing process like? Was it one of many things you were doing at the same time? Were you were you doing it in a you know, certain number of hours each day or how did that work? Well, it worked better once I did start committing to the, you know, it, I was playing around with it a lot. I hate to use that word, but um, you know, I would go in and out because I do have a very busy life. I'm still a newspaper columnist and syndicated. Mm -hmm. and, um, I teach at my alma mater at the journalism school there, two courses a semester as a professional in residence. And I'm always, I'm married to a Senator, US Senator. So there's that life that can be in, you know, a lot of public speaking. But, you know, I reached a point where I just thought I need to start winnowing down and focus on what I want to do next. I tell my students all the time, if you're never scared, you've stopped growing. And I realized oh, one of the no, big true. Oh, and that's what novel writing was for me. It was scaring me to death. And I thought, well, then this is the thing we must do. You can't keep telling your students this. I raised my kids this way and I'll soon be telling my grandchildren this mm -hmm. and not doing it myself. Yeah. Um, so my ritual, I'm not a morning person like my husband and me, he's up talking, I don't know, he's all ready to go. I'm up, but I'm really not that. But mm -hmm. I do find that's my best writing time. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a little bit of breakfast, coffee, some toast. I go into the sunroom typically now where I work and I light a uh, tea candle, which mm -hmm. lasts between three and four hours. And my promise to myself is that I will write for that time. Until the I love up. that. First, we have to stand up every hour, right? We can't just stay seated the whole time. Yes. But there's something about that flame that keeps me going because it's my promise to myself. And this, Love this is something we probably should talk a little bit more about, right? As writers, you have to take yourself seriously before anyone else is willing to. I mean, we're lucky to have maybe people who see it, like I had Kate Medina and my agent, Gail Ross. They're both such taskmasters. Um, and they're perfect. <laughs> they just are. I'm so used to bossing people around like crazy. And they are always bossing me around. But, you know, <laughs> but they're right. It is important to have people believe in you. But yeah. ultimately, you must take yourself seriously as a writer. Mm -hmm. And when I was very young in my 20s, I would look in the mirror and actually say to myself, you are a journalist. You are a mm -hmm. journalist. Long before anybody really wanted to, to take me seriously in that way, I think. Yeah. Um, and for me, I just always thought writing is so much a head game um, mm -hmm. that we have to take our, it, it's, it doesn't mean we don't have senses of humor about ourselves. God help us if we don't. Mm -hmm. But we do have to believe that we've got something to say and we got to get that negative voice out of our heads. And I, I just think of it as always flicking it off my shoulder. But yes. it's, being a columnist for 18 years has probably helped that because when I started out, sometimes I think, who's going to care what you think about this? And I just started imagining it as this thing I would just flick right off, which is oh, really great in dealing with hate mail. <laughs> oh, oh yes, so, that's good. <laughs> for you, when did you... Um, was, am I touching upon anything that sounds vaguely familiar to you, at least about the idea of taking yourself seriously? And I mean, it's all, yes, all of it, all of it, all of it. Um, I think the, well, so last summer I taught, or actually it was two summers ago now, I taught a course, uh, just a one week writing workshop in Aspen. And we decided, it was just a magical group. It was just a magical group of students and we all just really clicked and it was like we were a family. By the end of the week, it was so sad to part ways. And we decided as a group that we were going, it was the beginning of the summer. And so we decided we were going to have a summer of no angst um, as pertains to our writing. Of course, there's there are many things to feel angst about right now that you cannot deny, but... Um, we decided let's not waste time with it because every day as a writer, you will have these doubts. You will have these feelings of, why am I writing this? This is so stupid. This has been done before. This other thing just came out and it sounds kind of like my book and I mean, constant, constant, constant. So, you know, we're, we didn't want to have to try to train ourselves to be evolved enough to not feel those feelings because I don't know if that's even possible. Um, so we just said, let's, you know, no angst until September. And if I feel that way in July, if I'm having the doubts, I can just tell myself, you know what? Nope, I'm going to see you in September. You just go, you know, wait for me there. I'll see you there. And it was so effective that I've actually continued on with it. I just, I just keep pushing it down another month. I say, let me just write this and not have the doubts. And I, I can have the doubts later, but for now I'm not going to. And it really is helpful because we can be our own worst critics. Um, and we also, as you said, I love what you said about taking yourself seriously. When I first became a full-time fiction writer, um, many people in my life, people who love me, you know, dear, dear friends, but they almost felt like I was like a, 
it was like I had won the lottery and I just didn't have a job anymore and I was just hanging out at home all day, you know? So it would, at first it was like things where people would say like, would you be able to pick up this package at UPS for me? Cause it has to be picked up by three. And I'd be like, okay, sure. Yeah, I'm home, you know? And so I really actually had to make it clear, like, this is a job. This is a thing that I must do um, because I love it. It's sort of a vocation. It's amazing that I get to do it. It's such a gift, but also it's my job. It's how I support myself. So I have to actually be really disciplined about it. Um, and certainly, yes, that degree of taking yourself seriously is a huge part of that. And just kind of respecting the work. Um, though I do find it's funny that most fiction writers I know, you know, they started off writing fiction with some kind of a full-time job. And so whether or not they have it still, um, they still tend to keep the hours that they originally kept. And I'm kind of like that. I used to write late at night and now, you know, I have two young kids and pre COVID I had a, a lot of childcare, which was lovely. We had an amazing nanny, but I still got most of my writing done between like 11 PM and one in the morning or two in the morning, um, just as I did when I had a full-time job. And I'm finding now that that's very useful because I am with my kids all day long and then, you know, they go to bed and that's the only time I really have to write. I think generally the solitude is just like the number one thing a fiction writer needs. And so you often only find that before everyone else is awake or after they've gone to sleep. And it, that sounds so familiar to me. When I was writing when my kids were little and particularly after I became a single mom, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the evening hours, often until one, two, three in the morning. I must have just been constantly tired. I, I must, I mean, I remember fatigue a lot, but, but it does tell you something. If you'll do that so that you can write, because this was um, when I was a freelancer before I had a newspaper job. And then once I had a newspaper job, I would take on these giant narrative journalism projects mm -hmm. that require more than you could possibly do in the workday. And so late at night, and then I started writing essays on the side. Um, and that's where I really was getting a foothold yeah. naturally. And you, looking back on it now, because I'm considerably older than you, I see that, that it, we didn't call it what it was back then, but that was pure ambition. Mm -hmm. That was loving, I knew I could love my children and I could love my career. And in fact, I would probably love them more because I also had this career I loved. It, yeah. I felt the balance despite all the tension of that. And I have a favorite picture of me when my, my children are 12 years apart in age and Caitlin was about nine, not even nine months old. She wasn't walking in, she walked early. So she had to be around six. And she's sitting on my lap and my hair, I have the eighties glasses, the eighties hair. My bangs look like they were cut with a steak knife. I'm sitting in this <laughs> old robe sitting at the, on the floor of the coffee table, typing on my Smith Corona. I look like I have the thousand yard stare. I'm so tired, totally. but it was, I love the picture. And I have sometimes shared it to encourage young mothers. It, get, it does get easier. It, it's always going to be complicated, but if you're meant to do something, you're going to figure out a way to do it. And you owe nobody an apology for that. Yeah. Um, I, I could not have been this writer and have this career. And now I'm at the age where I, I had, a, I did a TEDx talk a couple well, 2016. I said, my generation of women, we are the very first really as a group who don't believe we have to become invisible and silent at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. that, and I mean, I have friends, I have a friend who went to medical school in her 40, she's still a physician. Um, I had one started her own business when you know, my baby was young and launched these whole new careers for themselves. I just think we, we are looking at this differently. You and I are on different sides of the ends of the spectrum, but we're both, I mean, what I would have given to have more friends like you who felt so um, empowered at a young age, we were constantly apologizing for ourselves, mm, right? Yeah. So in that way, with all the work that is yet to be done, I see real progress in Talented You and the way you're willing to own your ambition. And look what you're doing with it. Are you working on a new book? Thank you. Um, I am sort of, I'm, I'm working on a new book between um, 11 p.m. and 2 a.m., sort of. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, I, you made me think of something when I was first in New York, 
and just really trying to get a foothold, you know, and I didn't quite know how. And I, I had met someone who also, um, who worked for, wrote for magazines as a freelancer. And she was a couple of years older than me. And we were just walking by a newsstand and she said, well, look at all these magazines. She said, you know, they're filled with content or she probably didn't say content then. I don't know if we use that word then, but she said they're, you know, filled with words and, and um, someone has to write them. So, you know, why shouldn't it be you? And so, I had this thing that um, if I was offered an assignment, I said, yes, that was my, that was what I made myself do, you know, speaking of ambition. So when I worked at Allure and then when I went to the Times, you know, at the Times, it was wonderful. I got to write for the paper a lot, but I still wrote for Allure and I still wrote for every other women's magazine who would have me. And my second novel, I think had already come out or it was about to come out. And I was writing a piece for Marie Claire Australia, not even Marie Claire, but Marie Claire Australia, about um, former pageant, child pageant stars, beauty pageant stars who had now grown up. And in like 48 hours, I had to go to Texas, Alabama, and Tennessee to interview these, these beauty queens who are now in their mid 20s. And I got really sick in between two of those places. And I was throwing up on an airplane and I had this epiphany of like, wait a minute, I no longer have to say yes to every assignment. I actually, so that was the last piece I wrote under that umbrella of you will say yes to every opportunity. But speaking of ambitious, you know, that's how I started out with that feeling of you've got to do it. You've got it because you don't know where these things will lead. But and I do see that as a pivot also for you because you started to, you were going to take yourself really seriously as a, a novelist. That's right. You, you had to start saying no. That it's, is right. I think writers experience, we're always afraid the work could all run out. Yes. We're always afraid. That oh, yes, out, yes, right? yes. Um, I, I, I wish I could tell you at my age that changes, but it seems like when you, but yes. I've had to make some choices as well. If I'm going to, you know, I, I'm working on my second novel and um, I'm having to be it, it, your friend still sometimes it might I, I have a core of uh, friends who really support me have always supported me they're just fantastic um, when you get out to the other layers who don't know you as well they can sometimes think you're interruptible at any time right. or that you could certainly have time for this as well I've had a hard time saying no all of my life but I've decided right now I, I'm going to have to do that because time will run out for me um, much sooner than it will for you, if you know statistics hold. I don't imagine, and I don't imagine it's anytime soon. It's just when you have a mother who died at your age, it just you think about it. You can't yeah. not think about it. I also, though, I love to write. Yeah. I'm not, I was talking last night in a panel discussion. I'm not one of those writers who complains and says, "Oh, I love having written." I really love to write. The first yeah. draft is hard, but not like what my parents did for a living. And Kate Medina gave me another wonderful mantra for my life when I started complaining about the edits into uh, of my second book. And she said, you know what, honey, no whining on the yacht. Oh, it's yeah. So perfect. I love it's that. So, that's so perfect. Look what I get to do for a living, right? But I do have to take it seriously. I have to treat my, my work seriously or no one else is going to. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think it was when I was writing Saints for All Occasions and that book was my most difficult by far. I had to throw away, I think, 500 pages and start from scratch, which was absolutely crushing in the moment. And was that I, your I, decision? Was that your decision? To, did you well, see? Well, I had a couple of really wonderful early readers who are also fiction writers and friends, and they, and they did me really the kindness of telling me how bad it was. They didn't say throw this all away, but it was a conclusion that I, I came to on my own. And it was painful, but it was the right thing for that book. And somewhere along the line, I found right around that time when I was really having this pity party for myself, I found um, some of my, my grandmother when she passed away, you know, some of her, her jewelry that I had kept. And um, she had worked for the phone company and she would get these little uh, medals, I guess, every few years, you know, for being like a faithful employee of the phone company. Right. And so I, I started wearing one of them because it reminded me, like you said, I mean, it's like, what an amazing gift that I get to do this for my job. I get to just sit down and 
and do the job that I wished I could have in fourth grade. You know, um, I can't whine on the yacht. I can't complain because like, this is amazing, you know? And I'm sure my grandmother didn't like get up and dance a jig every day that she got to go to the phone company, but that was her job and she did it, you know? Yeah, so what you said in your, in your story here, what would she rather have been doing? It didn't yeah. matter. She did what she was supposed to do, right? And we're supposed to figure out the words. I mean, when I turned in my novel, why did it never occur to me to look up what's the average length of a novel? <laughs> I turned in 197,000 words. Oh, my goodness. It's such a great editor. And she said, you know, all these tight pages, single space of what you got to do next. She said, yeah, you know, it's a little long. The average novel is about 110,000. <laughs> so uh, it ended up being a little over 120,000, but I had to cut 50,000 words. Yeah. And um, I, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law were just asking over the weekend, how did you ever manage to do that? And I thought, you, you do figure it out. Once mm -hmm. you realize what you have to do, one of the things Kate had me do early is count the number of pages per character that you've mm -hmm. got. And I realized she was right that Brooke McGinty was the most fully realized character for me, even though this book is populated with women. And yeah. I think it's because I was so nervous about writing a male character that I spent more time on him initially. Oh, yes. And Ellie had to become a lot less of a whiner. You would not have liked her at all in the beginning. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah, and that was all, so you could get, rid, get rid of a lot of stuff, you know, but wow, what an experience that was. I, I, I'd like to not repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also feel that having um, a background, for me, a bit of a background for you, quite a, an amazing background in, in, in journalism, you know, um, it helps with fiction writing because partly it helps because you you understand that you are writing for an audience you are writing for someone to read the thing you're writing right and so sometimes a detour might be really enjoyable for you as a writer but you know at the end of the day you know i have to get rid of this because yeah. it's not going to hold the reader's attention yeah. um and that sense also you know for me when i when I worked, um, especially in magazines, I think the edits were really intense. And then I went to the Times and I was writing for the Times and I found to my delight that the, the edits were less intense than they had been in women's magazines for whatever reason. Um, but still, of course there are edits and you, you make them, you know, the editor tells you what to do and you do it. Right. And I remember with my first novel, my editor gave me wonderful notes. And then she said at the end of this letter, but of course it's all up to you. Um, right. And I was like, it is? I, I can't believe that. I did not know that um, because it's not all up to you when you're writing, you know, for a newspaper or a magazine. So That's right. I always feel like I wouldn't want to write anything that wasn't, that hadn't been edited. I wouldn't want to publish anything that hadn't been edited. To me, it's like sending your book off to Canyon Ranch and it comes back thinner and glowing and it's better, you know. Um, so anyway, we've been talking and I forgot all about the audience questions because I love talking to you so much, but I, I guess <laughs> so we should read that. that. Tom, do we have some questions? Sorry, everyone. Are we supposed to ask them ourselves, Tom? Or, oh, I see. Uh, I'm gonna read them to you guys. Um, and uh, we have a couple. Um, there's one here to the both of you guys. Um, it says, please speak to the joys and challenges of writing intergenerational novels. Both of you have successfully accomplished this and it's hard to do it in a non-sentimental way. Mm. Or do you wanna go first? Um, so, hmm. well, I think um, I did an event last week with Emma Straub and, and I mentioned to her how all of her most recent, I think her three most recent novels all have an adolescent girl in them. And I, I was asking her about that because it's not an age that I would probably leap to write about. I don't feel overly connected to. And, and um, she was saying, you know, we all have some sort of internal age maybe. And for me, I think I'm, my internal age is like 82 or something maybe, because I love writing the, the older matriarch of a large family. That is a character I, I love to write and I find easier to write in some ways than a character my own age, which is odd. But um, uh, I love, you know, looking, I come from a large family. I was always fascinated as a kid by the fact that one incident, one conversation could reverberate through a group of people and have really different outcomes for all of them, if that makes sense. Um, and I love the idea of, of sort of 
everyone kind of having a piece of the story, no one having the whole story, going back to the, the family secrets and the notion of kind of cycles. So the, the way that you mother very much being impacted by the way you were mothered uh, in one direction or the other. Um, you know, in my family stories, certainly alcohol and the cycles that that um, creates appears again and again. Um, so I think, uh, you know, my, my husband comes from a smaller family from, he's from Iowa, he's from Des Moines, Iowa. And so my family is like loud and large and rambunctious and every time uh, someone in the family leaves the room or leaves the party, everyone is talking about them. That's just how we are. It's not really rude or mean. It's just kind of how we are. We're just a bunch of gossips, I guess. And so I remember the first time I met my husband's family, we're all sitting around and then maybe his uncle or someone left the house and it was just, you know, silence. And I was like, waiting, like, well, aren't you going to talk about him? Aren't you going to tell me some story about this person who just left? And the answer was, no, we're not going to. So anyway, I guess, you know, the intergenerational stuff to me, I love writing about a group of interconnected people and family is always sort of my number one go-to for that. For me, it was pretty natural to do it because one of the themes of, the, of my novel is the, the straddling of two worlds that happens when you're the first in your family to go to college. It's always mm -hmm. there. And you're trying to be loyal to the generation before you, but you want to think about what comes for you and the generation after you. Um, but I've also, you know, when I think about my own life, I've always had some older friends, some very much older than I. And as I get older, I have a, a growing number of young friends, particularly young women, um, that I love being in touch with and learning from. And of course, being around my students who are in their early 20s. So I'm fascinated by one of the things that's interested me so much about my students, and this is as true for the men as the women, I always have them do their first essay is basically what my first column was. I wrote about my dad's lunch pail. So a story from my life that could close the distance with my readers, because most come from, if not immediate working class roots, only one or two generations away. I couldn't get over how many of them wrote about grandparents, their relationship with grandparents. And I thought, you know, it's in us. Um, we really we really do want to know and think about who we come from and who we want to be. And then when you have children, who do you want them to be? It's such a natural progression. And as Courtney said, family secrets, man, they, they don't die with one person typically. And they can become so much bigger than they needed to be or yeah. become so misunderstood and have such an impact. And I just, having a family that had a lot of secrets, um, I love exploring that topic. And I doubt that I'll be giving it up anytime soon. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. And um, I'm going to go to this one from Christopher Moore. Uh, he says he's a fan of the both of you guys. And he asks, well, he, he gives this quote. My dad used to quote Robertson Davies as saying that after being a newspaper editor for years, he liked doing fiction because he could finally tell the truth. Ooh. Do you feel this way or was it hard to be unrooted from facts? Uh, I quote Mae Sarton all the time, the former novelist who published a number of her journals. She said, and I'm paraphrasing, but perhaps only in fiction can we be totally honest. And I've said, if that's the case, then this is the most honest piece of writing I've ever done. And I think, um, I mean, I'm writing about the working class and what I come from. I don't romanticize them. I don't demonize them. I see them as complicated because that's how I've always known them. But I can be, unlike, in a, I, I talk about this all the time as a journalist, you could always, if you hit a snag, you pick up the phone, you could do another interview, you could do a little more research. When you hit a snag or, or, or you're stalled in your novel, it's all oh, gotta come up in here and you gotta figure out who it is. Well, and I tell my students all the time, you can't quote somebody and say they believe something, they think something. You can say they say they believe, they say they think. Now, I know exactly what they're thinking and I know what they believe. And it's quite liberating to be able to do that. Oh yes, I, I agree so much so. And I think it's funny because, you know, I think about, you know, not all fiction writers are this way, but like you wanted to know the weight of that blue case behind you, right? And and I am like that too. I, I would not write about um, a town I hadn't spent a lot of time in because I want to make sure I get everything right. Um, I remember when I wrote my book, uh, the engagements, which is partly about an advertising agency that no longer exists called NWR, um, 
in Philadelphia. The building, the NWR building still exists. It's um, now condos. And, and so many of the people, I interviewed many people who have worked there. And so many of them told me that just about the weight of the front door of the building for some reason, Ooh. that it is this golden door and it is so heavy. And I had to like know how it felt. So I went from New York to Philadelphia just to open that door, just to see what it felt like in my hand so I could write it. So I think for a writer like me or like you, I think, Connie, you know, you, your, your outer world is very much grounded in fact, um, but that, that element that makes fiction so magical is that, you know, as real people, um, especially journalists, people who interview other people, we always want to know what's going on, what's going on in this other person's life and, and what you can never truly know is what is in this person's head what is in this person's heart and as a fiction writer you get to go in there and you get to say what it is and i just love that part so much so thank you christopher for that question we both had pretty definite answers about it it's nice to yes. hear from you. yes do you guys want to do one more we just got one that came in from erica um she says um great seeing both of you connie in your novel and jay courtney in your last novel saints for all occasions a major event was an unplanned pregnancy and the reverberations of that over the decades. What are your thoughts about the decision of employers opting out of birth control for women? Oh. Ooh, very topical question to end it. Yeah, it sure is. Go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I wanna hear the Connie Schultz answer on this, but my, but my, um, oh, I mean, you know, I think something that we have seen really we see it all the time, but we're seeing it in such stark relief right now during COVID is how little our culture in general values um, home life and, the, and childcare and having children and women right to do so or not when you want to, but then also once the children are here, there's no, you know, backup. I mean, right now, every woman I know, and men too, who have children um, are being advised to do their jobs as, as much as they ever did, but also have your children with you full time and somehow just do it. And there's no, you know, I don't know if you read the piece by Deb Perlman in the Times last week. It was so extraordinary, just saying basically right now, you can either have kids or have a job um, but not both, but we're all supposed to be doing both somehow. So how does this connect to birth control? All I am saying is that, you know, employer sponsored, uh, it's not sponsored either because, you know, your health insurance is paying for it, right? Um, but anywho. Um, but if it's provided by your employer and your employer uh, cites religious objection to birth control, he can deny you access to birth control. Right. I think so, it's outrageous, but I, you know. It's, but it it's is outrageous. Right. I would like to, uh, here's what I'm hoping, one of the things that's going to happen. We already know Hobby Lobby, for example, was one of the companies that's what brought this about. I will never step foot, I will never darken that door. I want to know a list of the employers, and I think we're going to be finding out pretty quickly. Who are the employers who feel entitled to tell women what they can do with their reproductive health? Who are the employers who feel entitled to tell women you're on your own to take care of your bodies and to, and to take care of your families? Um, we're just going to have to get very serious about what this is going to mean in terms of repercussions for companies. We, we will ultimately have to continue to advocate for women of reproductive, my daughter would still call us women of reproductive age, but it, you know, that's what we're talking about is women who need, need to have access to birth control. And can I just say this? We see so many, including members of Congress right now from the right, who are arguing that it's their right to have control over their own bodies and not wear face masks that would protect others. That's why we wear them. We wear them to protect one another. And yet now they think they can also weigh in and say okay. women should not be in control of their own birth control. I could go on and on and I won't because anybody who follows me already knows how I think about this, but I'm going to look forward to writing about it. I think also where we in this country, we tie employment and healthcare together and, and you know, completely and whether that's right or wrong that is what we do so to make your place of work not the place where you get birth control which is just sort of a basic um health you know piece of the puzzle for most women 
it's just ridiculous. It's crazy. I see that the Erica who answered that was Erica, in fact, Erica Robinson, who went to high school with me. Oh. I'm not at all surprised that she would be asking that. She is wonderful in so many ways, including always speaking her mind. I love it. Thank you, Erica. And thank you everyone who submitted questions and everyone who was here with us tonight. Um, this was a really fascinating talk, guys, about, about writing and the writer's life. And I think we all got a lot out of it. Um, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, um, Tom. Tom, thank you for doing all this for us. We appreciate uh, it. You've been there uh, the whole time with us. Thank you. Oh, of course, it's our pleasure. And just to remind everyone that in the chat, we have a link to both Friends and Strangers and the Daughters of Erie Town. And we really encourage everyone to click on those and then purchase those books. And um, thank you all for, for joining us. And um, thank you to our two authors. And we will see you again next time on Politics and Prose Live. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.